here in the state of New Mexico and I'm here with, well, Lorraine is here with me today. Mm -hmm. and Dr. Eric Lindman, who's the director of New Mexico Office of Archaeological Studies, is sadly up in Santa Fe. We miss having him here. And Lorraine Lewis, delightful human being who uh, makes uh, beautiful pottery that she will share with you, is here with me today. So I'm going to let them take it away and enjoy. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Eric, and I'd like to welcome all of the audience uh, who's showing interest in this program today and those who join us through the process. Um, I'm an archaeologist who's been working in the Southwest for, boy, 40 years or more. And though when I was in college, I swore that I would never be involved in Southwestern archeology span and I would certainly never have anything to do with pottery. After I got here, I found the magic of what pottery can be both as beauty, as substance, as form, as timekeeper, as measure of cultural influences and identity across the incredible richness of the past 2,000 years of the history of the many different Pueblo peoples that exist. So I've been studying pottery technology in its ancient cultural context, and I can claim to be, oh, maybe a technician or an artisan, uh, but I stop short of thinking of myself as an artist, and I leave that to uh, more exciting and wonderful people like Lorraine. Now, I'll let you introduce yourself. My name is Lorraine Gayla Lewis, and I'm an enrolled member of the Laguna Pueblo on my mother's side, and I'm also Taos Pueblo in Hopi on my father's side, him coming from Palaka. Arizona. And um, I was very fortunate to grow up here in the Southwest. Um, I was actually born and raised in California, in San Diego. My father was in the service. And uh, we lived there for a period of time, and unfortunately, we lost him. And so our mother, she moved us back closer to home, which is um, the Albuquerque area, which is very close to Laguna Pueblo. And she met my stepfather, who comes from Nambe Pueblo, which is a beautiful Pueblo, which is located outside of uh, Santa Fe. It's at the foot of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, really beautiful area. And so I was very blessed to be brought up in a traditional home. My uh, father, my stepfather, Victor, he uh, raised us traditionally. So we took part in our feast days and we took part in our dancing in all of the communal activities that we have. So I was very, um, I was always surrounded by the outdoors and I loved venturing out and working with clay. That just kind of came naturally to me. Um, I began my art career at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. I am a graduate, um, both high school and college, and then I also went on to the College of Santa Fe. Um, I began studying various forms of art. Um, I kept gravitating back to painting and to uh, working with clay. Um, I actually had some really great instructors at the Institute. Um, we call it IAIA. Uh, one of my instructors was uh, Ralph Partington. He was a, a commercial clay artist and he did beautiful forms of clay, very contemporary. And um, I also had some instructors that were traditional. Um, one of them being Adelie Lolama, who's very well known um, for her painting. She's Hopi and um, she's also known for her pottery as well. Another uh, person that I met was a student and his name was um, uh, Nathan Begay, and Nathan is, he, he's passed on since, but Nathan was a very renowned Hopi potter, and he and I became really good friends, and we, he taught me a lot about the traditional um, ways to process clay, uh, the traditional ways to fire, and also the traditional materials used um, in making clay, or making pottery, and so that was really a wonderful 
team I think we we created we had a lot of fun together um, in my earlier forms of art I started working a lot with figurative form and Nathan really helped me along that I was making um, the storyteller type figure pieces of pottery um, after a number of years they became my signature pieces and um, I just really enjoyed working in that area um, there was a point in time around um, 2009 where I just became really um, antsy about wanting to start learning to do other types and forms of pottery. And so I took a year off and I was just kind of moving around, figuring out what I wanted to do with my art. And it just so happened I met a, a friend, um, his neighbor is named Bill Freeman. And Bill was a very avid collector of um, indigenous pottery from around the world. And I went to his house, he invited me over and it was just like a museum. He had beautiful pieces of pottery from all over the world. And I studied a lot of those pieces and it was just, he, he opened my eyes to um, going backward in time and starting to study our ancestral pieces. He had a whole book collection that I would borrow books from him and I would just look through these books and um, I would uh, see all these beautiful pieces and I started looking at design work and shape and form. And from there I thought, you know, I should be really studying our ancestral pieces because there's so many beautiful pieces that are on exhibit in museums and private collections that people don't get to view. and um, so from there, I just decided I'm going to go ahead and start making some of my own pieces. So I did. I started off with a, a little bowl and I thought, okay, I want to try the Mimbra style because the Mimbras have really amazing um, uh, just characters, pe people. Um, they've got animals. They've got um, different, just a lot of design elements in there. And so I was really happy when I made this little small members bowl and I thought this is great. And I just want to show you a sample of one of my pieces and it's, I just so happens to be a little members bowl. So it's just one of these, oh, I don't know if you could see it, but little jackrabbit here. And um, I just thought, you know, it was very pleasing. And so I just continued on with that. And I, I did the member style for a period of time. And then I thought there's so many other cultural, there's so many other areas I wanna look into. And another one was um, the Chaco style vessels that were made um, in the area. Some of, a lot of it was traded in as well. And so I just was very fortunate to, um, through the Maxwell Museum, they offered, it was called the Chaco Heritage Project, and they selected 10 artists. And by then I had been doing a lot of my um, ancient style recreations. And so they selected me as one of the artists to go there and do a study at Chaco Canyon. And that really opened up my eyes. Um, I was able to um, see the collection and it's housed at the Maxwell Museum at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque and it's a wonderful collection um, it's through the National Park Service and I was able to study a lot of the items that were um, housed there and one thing that really captured my eye was and I've always read about these in books were the Chaco vessels the cylinder vessels and the cylinder vessels were very fascinating because they were upright form and they were just beautifully done. Um, I actually attended a, a lecture by uh, Patty Crown and I learned a lot about the cylinder vessels and I thought, I'm gonna try to make my own vessels. <laughs> so I did, I, I made several um, cylinder vessels and I have another sample here. This is, oh, I'm sorry. I, this is a style of vessel. You can get it on there. And the vessels were very, um, I, I believe they were made for a certain purpose. And I, 
I don't know too much about um, why they were made um, and who they were made for, but I know they were highly regarded because um, in the excavation, they found a whole room full of vessels and they were all, of course, they were crushed. But um, in the bottom of the vessels, there, were, um, there was a residue and it turned out to be cacao. And that residue um, just proved that through the trading route, how far things had come. And um, so it was very fascinating to me. And in these vessels, I thought, no wonder they made them cylindrical because they were probably made to contain the heat and to keep things warm. So I just thought that was very fascinating. The designs were just incredible. Um, so I was fascinated by those pieces. And then I kind of ventured around to um, the Four Corners area where the Mesa Verde people lived. And those are also our ancestors as well. And so I was looking at the mug collection and I thought, I really want to build a mug. So I made a, a, a mug and I, then I started making several, a series of mugs and I thought, wow, these are great because I'm not only learning about um, these utilitarian style pieces that um, our ancestors created, um, I'm actually painting one with their designs. And through that, I feel that, um, that continuous flow when I'm painting their designs onto my pieces. And I just feel that connection with our ancestors. And if I can get this on, this is another piece. This is the mug that I did. This is a Mesa Verde design. And this is another version that I have here. See this one? I'm not, oh, sorry about that. I'm playing with the, but uh, it's, it's kind of, kind of reminds me of a piano design. It's beautiful, but yeah, I'm sorry. My zoom is not working too well. Um, but anyway, I just um, decided to continue um, learning about the cultures in the different areas. There's so many throughout the Southwest and I've learned quite a bit. And I really enjoy what I'm doing. The what Lorraine is talking or is sort of the modern expression of is literally uh, 4,000 years of experimentation with pottery as a ceramic art form. Uh, beginning the earliest villages in southern Arizona, northern Mexico, uh, where corn was abundant enough, the crop that people settled in villages. And the most surprising things to the archaeologists, and I think even fellow people today, is that the first pottery vessels weren't anything that we would really expect them to be. They were uh, knickknacks, they were saucers, they were very small vessels that you might uh, keep around the house, but they weren't cooking jars and they weren't storage jars and they they weren't for carrying water. Very much more in a ceremonial role, but without elaborate decoration, without uh, sort of the the things that we take for granted when we look at the richness of pottery that is uh, as expressed in today's uh, Pueblo cultures. And that sort of very, very relaxed and unpressured approach to making pottery lasted for 2,000 years. And it wasn't really until about 2,000 years ago that the uh, potential of fired clay became translated into storage containers first and then into cooking containers. And one of the surprising things is they were using the same vessel form uh, for both, which was really, I'll pull this back so you can, uh, nothing more than a melon shaped seed jar. Um, again, first used for uh, storage, 
but then quickly we see evidence of creosote deposits on the outside, sooting from using over a fire, and it the the true functional potential of ceramic containers starts to take off. Oh, eighteen hundred years ago, and from that point it never stopped. Um, as soon as Pueblo people, Pueblo potters begin to really recognize the shape potential of fired clay, the idea that you could make it into any form you wanted, um, that spread like wildfire. So that uh, from say 1800 years ago to uh, maybe uh, 1500 years ago, every single ancestral Pueblo population, people were making pottery and adapting uh, basic foundations of pottery technology to the uh, rich and diverse resources that were available in their landscapes. And that really starts setting that, uh, the intimate relationship between pottery technology, pottery decorative style, and the way pottery was used, it starts linking it to the landscape and linking it to the richness of culture that eventually gets expressed in places like chocolate. I think, you know, I was very fortunate to grow up in a Pueblo and be amongst a lot of um, artists and artisans and um, learning about the different types of clay that come from different pueblos and I really thought that was um, it, it's a gift um, throughout my life I was very fortunate to visit places ancestral places like um, Dandelier, Mesa Verde, um, Puye Cliffs. I really loved walking the um, ancestral paths um, and following in my ancestors um, footsteps. I think um, seeing the pottery, uh, studying the drawings, and really feeling the presence of our ancestors um, really made me connect with what I'm doing today. And I really love um, doing a lot of the research, um, working with the museums, working with uh, the collectors, and just seeing these pieces. Um, every time I visit a place, I feel like a kid in a candy store. I just came from the Western New Mexico University collection, which houses a lot of the members pottery. I had never been there and I just thought that was very fascinating. Um, I, I just can't say enough and I always encourage um, my fellow potters, Pueblo potters to visit these collections because New Mexico has a great um, a lot of great museums, wonderful collections, and this is how we learn. Um, we're able to go in and study these pieces and ask questions and give our input and um, find that relationship. Um, we just continue on creating because now a lot of these designs that are on some of these ancestral pieces are, well, all these designs, I should say, are carried over into today's contemporary pottery, either by form, by design, um, just by the shape. Um, there's something we draw from our ancestral pottery, and it's really important that we um, understand all of this. Um, I always talk to my ancestors and introduce myself whenever I go into um, a their home area, like their dwellings. Um, my, as I had mentioned, my father is a traditionalist and he always taught me there's a proper way to enter into a dwelling place by introducing yourself, letting them know your intentions, saying your prayers and leaving an offering. And um, you, you just gain so much from walking these paths. And it's just very important that you carry that with you and you build and you continue in that manner. Um, we're always thankful and very respectful of what we do. And so visiting these places and studying these early art forms really 
fire my creativity. Um, there's a lot of stories about emergence into this world and our livelihood. Um, these stories are evident in um, early works of traditional arts. Um, the early paintings, uh, the petroglyphs and the rock carvings. There's a continuous cycle of creating and the work is really a true reflection of self, what was felt by that individual during that time in the environment. Um, our earliest potters, I think, captured these moments. We didn't know what they were going through at the time, if there was a drought, if there was a lack of food. Um, there was always this continuous cycle though, of creating. Uh, their lifestyles constantly changed, and so did the techniques of the pottery. Um, the forms and designs, they evolved. Um, pottery became more innovative, and it also became refined and sophisticated over time. And it's just wonderful to see this, you know, when you visit some of these collections, the earliest basket maker form how things evolved from there into what they've become. Um, I believe that our ancestors um, passed on, you know, many of these creative forms and the forms and designs are incorporated into today's traditional contemporary pottery. Um, with my pottery, I try to capture the aesthetics. Um, I've worked with traditional clays. I've worked with contemporary clays. Um, and the work that I'm recreating right now, I'm, I have a blend of clay that I work with. But um, my goal is to capture the beauty and individuality of each piece. So I share these recreations with respect and in hope of preserving um, a pottery culture that existed hundreds of years ago. Um, to share a culture with uh, others and through conservation, um, there is that need to educate and to teach others to respect and care and appreciate our natural and cultural resources. Um, with development, I feel that it's vital in our fight to protect the environment. And through conservation, we need to teach others to appreciate these resources. So we can continue to pass these on to our grandchildren so they can learn and respect our culture as well. Um, I believe we were given these gifts of traditions and ties to our universe, to our creator. Um, we are strong, we are strong people. And for those that have come and gone before us, um, this just shows us how connected we are to our pieces. I'd like to build on one thing that Lorraine said that I don't think is appreciated uh, very much by the Euro-American culture that is so dominant today. And it comes to us, a, a glimpse of it comes to us through language. And Bruce Hucko uh, did education programs in the Tewa Pueblos with Tewa youth, bringing art into the classroom. And a book that he wrote has uh, titled something like where there is no name for art and there's no linguistic category in the Tewa language for art in the sense that it's present in Indo-European languages. Instead, when we look at Pueblo culture, Art is something that was imbued into absolutely everything that you did. There was no thought of uh, making a sandal or making an arrowhead or making a pot without integrating into that object of creation all of those uh, cultural elements, all of those symbols, all of that feeling and communication that often in our culture today, we set aside and, uh, you know, characterizes art. Um, you know, I don't 
make my shirt. I purchase it, you know, uh, in the store and I have no idea who or where it was made. And as a result, I don't have a connection with that. But in the history of Pueblo peoples, everything that was surrounding the family, everything, every means of interaction between you and your neighbor and your distant cousin and the visitor who comes into the village, all of those interactions involve material items that were handmade, that carried with them aesthetic qualities that were you know, completely transcended the object itself. And that's uh, when we look at the ancient pottery and when we look at uh, artistic expressions that are derived from it, I think those of us who are outside Pueblo culture really need to remember that there's a, a depth of connection in those pieces that we may only be able to glimpse at the level, a very superficial level. And I can elaborate one more thing, <laughs> <laughs> which is that in our, in our desire to, and I'm speaking as an archeologist, Archaeologists are confronted with variability in potsherds. Uh, they look different. They have different designs. They're made of different raw materials. We sort them into piles. We count them. We create percentages and data tables and all of this sort of stuff. And a lot of times, because we're not potters, because we don't have the experience of touching the clay, of handling the clay, of feeling uh, what it, how it speaks, how it would speak to a potter if we were potters. We can miss things. And there's a very, very sort of functional example that I can give as I reach for my, my show and tell pieces. Uh, one of the most beautiful traditions in pottery in the Southwest is really the simple cooking jar and the corrugated surfaces that we're used to seeing in collections of, um, from Mesa Verde to Chaco and even uh, down in the, the museum at Western. Um, because Maguillon uh, potters took advantage of this texture. And for the longest time, this texture was viewed as uh, beautiful. It was viewed as a stylistic end product as if it were the result of the Western Euro-American concept of progress. And surprisingly, when the archaeologists came in to do archaeology in Fouillet, in the northern Rio Grande Valley, they didn't see very much of this. And so when they classified the pottery that had very subtle textures. Uh, they used descriptive terms like smeared indented or blind corrugated, which were actually in some senses pejorative because they wanted it to look like what they saw at Chaco. But the hand motions that were used for generations of potters on the Colorado Plateau are different than the hand motions that were used by generations of potters in the Rio Grande Valley. And the hand motions on the Colorado Plateau allowed and even encouraged this sort of textural expression where the hand motions in the Northern Rio Grande weren't compatible with it. And then we add another experimental side to it, which is the popularity of this texture. It turns out that if you put any texture on the neck of a vessel, a cooking jar like this, it will perform better against boil over. And this is actually 
one of the most marvelous inventions of the women. And since the women are cooking with the vessels and making the vessels, the boil over resistance of neck texture spread like wildfire. For the archeologists, it's wonderful because it gives us a dating tool. And then they s extended that texture over the entire surface of the vessel. And the first woman who did that discovered that her vessel lasted at least twice as long in use than a plain bottomed vessel. And again, that innovation spreads like wildfire across the entirety of the Southwest. And it looks beautiful, but if we stop thinking of it only in terms of its appearance, we miss that there can be major ethnic divides in the concept of how you make a pot. And we miss that the sophistication of uh, engineering design that went on within the community of potters, where they were really innovating and trying to find new things to uh, explore and to enrich their lives. And so we've got really remarkable things going on, even in the humble cooking jar uh, that have, uh, that exist under the surface, that if you're just an archeologist, if you never touch clay, if you don't have a connection with that uh, a fundamental possibility that clay provides the artist, um, you're gonna miss out on a tremendous amount of the richness uh, that's available in the history of Pueblo peoples. It's amazing today um, how we still utilize a lot of our pottery for cooking and um, drinking. And um, that's something that uh, we've never um, ever stepped away from. In cooking, there's some beautiful um, clay pieces that are micaceous, we call it uh, micaceous clay. It comes from the Northern New Mexico area. And the, the texture and the material that the clay has is just incredible for um, sustaining heat. And you can make these beautiful vessels out of micaceous clay and you can actually put them, their heat direct. And it's really incredible that um, the, the flavor, it, how it enhances your food and your water, it just makes things taste and, uh, a lot better. Um, but we've been utilizing our clay, um, even in the presence now, you know, the Pueblo people are real big on serving with traditional clay bowls. If you come to a feast day in the Pueblo, you'll see on the table, they'll have like a, a pottery bowl and they'll be filled with some kind of stew or beans. And, um, you know, even water drinking out of these um, micaceous clay vessels, it just makes the water taste really great, very earthy. Um, so that's something that we've always continued on and I would continue that on with my, um, grandchildren as well and um, I want them to learn that um, it's not only for just looking at and collecting it's something to be used and that's a big part of our tradition as well and then you know going back to what Eric had said about that connection when you're working with clay and when you're feeling it um, I believe that you know with clay you're bringing to life a feeling that comes from within and this actually becomes a part of you. So everything you touch and create has a purpose. And um, whether it's, you know, just something beautiful you created that you wanna share with somebody or a utilitarian purpose. So it all ties in together. And I got a question via chat and people should feel free to use the chat function if they'd like to for either Lorraine or uh, for me. And 
the question was the technological one of why would texture make a pot last longer? And when you think of uh, the act of cooking over a fire, you have stew uh, that is simmering away at you know the boiling point of water, but it's being heated by coals that are four to five times as hot. And that puts a tremendous amount of thermal expansion stress across the vessel wall from the outer surface of the vessel that is superheated to the relatively cool, but still boiling, uh, temperature of the inner wall of the vessel. And uh, the tradition of pottery in the Southwest uh, is the potters select the tempering agents that they add to the clay with function in mind and what texture does and it's uh, it's sort of hard to illustrate is that that texture on the outside allows the hotter surface to expand and contract just a little bit without the stress being conveyed catastrophically across the vessel wall and it's that little bit of absorbing of expansion stress that makes texture work. And the texture can be like many Navajo vessels where the outsides are simply scraped uh, deeply with a corn cob. Uh, you could use a pocket comb. Uh, the texture on the Colorado Plateau is created by just rhythmic pinching as you add the fresh coil of clay to your growing vessel. Um, in the Rio Grande Valley, just the unevenness of the surface uh, gives it that little bit of extra resistance to heat stress. And then, boy, mica pottery. Mica pottery, the raw materials of mica pottery are the best you can get for making a cooking jar. The quartz grains, um, if you have a quartz grain in your uh, vessel wall during firing, as the temperature heats up, that vessel, that grain expands. And then as the vessel cools down at the end of the firing, it contracts back to its original size. So every quartz uh, grain, creates a little tiny void between itself and the fired clay that surrounds it. And that void, when a crack starts to propagate and hits that void, the void absorbs all of the stress of the crack. And so we see coarsely tempered uh, uh, <clears throat> materials in cooking jars, much more so than those beautiful mimbrous bowls, uh, where you don't need heat shock resistance. Uh, <clears throat> and then the mica, the mica platelets do exactly the same thing. So micaceous clay is this combination of quartz, which has, you know, a 2000 year history of use in cooking jars. Then you have this spectacular clay that's discovered up in the mountains of the Sangre de Cristos. But uh, as soon as that's discovered, uh, we have communities of potters who, that don't have access to micaceous clays. They're making their own by crushing up schist. Uh, they're trying to emulate the natural micaceous clays in areas where they don't have it. Um, so cooking jars are a remarkable uh, cauldron for innovation uh, in many ways. And I love Lorraine's description of how it just makes the pots taste, or the beans taste better. It makes the water taste better. There's this connection. And it's a connection that we lose because in our society of uh, pottery technology, we glaze things. We make them impermeable to moisture. And so you don't have the interaction between the substance of the clay and the substance of what is being formed. Uh, and or what is being consumed uh, from the vessel. So uh, there's 
so much to think about in terms of the relationship between uh, people's lives and the clays that they use to make their pots. It's really interesting Eric, that you mentioned the micaceous clay, um, the, the relationship with that. Um, when I, I went to uh, dig for some clay to northern New Mexico, which is around the Ojo Caliente area, and it's beautiful because as you're walking the grounds, you start to see a lot of the rocks, and then pretty soon you start to see the ground. It just starts to glitter and everything just like it, it's just so glittery and you know you're become you're getting close to the clay pits there and it's really exciting um, when you go and you actually start digging the clay it's just a, a whole different feel because you know I'm, I'm used to working with various types of clays um, traditional and non-traditional but i think by far my caseous clay there's just something so special to it um, it's just uh really nice to to work with it it's got like this elasticity to it and it's just really slick and you can build your walls very thin you could um, build figurative form pretty easily it's really a nice clay to work with but having that relationship with that clay is just um uh very uh special and then you know eric did touch on some of the the sources of clay um a lot we're seeing a lot of our clay pits um, overmined. Um, we're seeing some of our clay pits being, um, uh, we're not able to access anymore as Pueblo people. And that really is something that, um, you know, is, is sad that happens, but you know, it's just, we make the best of what we can with our resources in our own backyard. Um, we do a lot of trading with others, you know, other Pueblos, if we don't have access to say some mica clay and somebody has access to say like a white clay or brown clay, we'll trade and, you know, we'll incorporate that into our um, other versions of clay that we're using. So we'll have like say a, a brown ware clay, we'll add like a mica slip to it, something that maybe we had traded with somebody and, um, but it's, it's really a great relationship with other, other Pueblo people too. We all share that same knowledge and we all share that commonality that we're all potters. So that's something that I love seeing um, other artists work with others and do collaborations. It's amazing. Yeah, I'll, there's an, a great sort of tension in uh, underlying concepts of cultural appropriation. Um, and one of those is the exhaustion of rare resources, resources where coming from uh, an industrial mercantile culture, Euro-American culture, uh, there's a tendency that we have to maximize resources, to uh, use them as quickly as we possibly can, uh, even to get into competition, so that uh, one person's uh, financial or artistic success really is dependent upon getting it first and getting it most. And that, uh, it pains me a little when I see people from outside of the cultural context of particular artistic traditions, pottery traditions in particular, where the resource depletion starts to impact and take away from the continuity of culture that those resources are really connected with in indigenous communities. And it's as an archaeologist, I'm always, in, in a sense, prospecting for clay. I want to understand the diversity of the resources that are out there on the landscape. And occasionally I've come across resources that I know potters would want to use. And uh, when I introduce them to it, if they choose to use those resources, that's the point where I step back. It is now a gift I've given to them 
and it's theirs. And if I want to do experimental work, it's up to me to find another source rather than depleting the source that I've passed on. And it's, um, you know, Pueblo peoples, their cultures formed with a population much lower than it is today. We now are putting so much pressure on our environment in so many different ways that um, there's, you know, I don't mean this in any trite sense, but there are lessons to be learned about sustainability from something as simple as making a pot, but making a pot traditionally and making a pot in a context where its use, well, from its full life history, is so intimately connected with the culture of origin. And um, that's something I would love to see Euro-American culture uh, embrace within ourselves, but not in the sense of appropriating Pueblo culture, Pueblo designs, uh, you know, I do not have a cultural connection with members' designs or Chaco designs. And for me to pretend that I do is an injustice to uh, the richness of Lorraine and her heritage and her artistic expressions. I'm sorry for straying into the political, but there is a cultural set of cultural politics that goes on here. I think, you know, after years of studying um, this ancestral work, it's just really, I think one of the most rewarding things um, that have come to me are from my fellow artists, um, clay artists, and they want to trade or they want to purchase or, you know, we work something out. And I think that's probably one of the biggest, it's so gratifying because, you know, I, I've, some of these are, are, are just top well-known potters um, that want a piece of my work. And I'm just excited because it's like, they're, they're the ones that I want their work. And um, it's just an honor because it speaks volumes. Um, Many of these clay artists tell me, keep doing this, keep doing this. You're keeping this alive. Um, there's so many beautiful pieces out there. There's so many designs out there that we'll never ever get to see or share. And so when they call me or contact me and we talk about this, um, we have great discussions about um, uh, these designs and shapes and forms of pottery. And I think it's just really gratifying that um, other potters that are very well known want to collect a piece of my work. And I think that that means more to me than anything. And I encourage um, my fellow artists and potters, I, I tell them, and, and any, any um, native artist that is using a lot of design, I, I always tell them to visit the pottery collections because there's so much to learn from them just by looking at the pieces. It's just, you can see so much involved and so much thought and creativity that goes into these designs. It's just amazing. And so this is a great learning tool. And I really am grateful for, you know, the, the museums that allow us um, to go in and see their collections and, um, it means a lot to us. We're just continuing on and, and um, they're very grateful to do that for us. So I always encourage my fellow artists, you know, view our collections, look at them. And these, these pieces are protected and they're there for us so we can learn from them. I can also relate an anecdote of in some senses, the importance of tradition and where in the past, uh, well, we're in a pandemic 
and we're very unsettled and we're very uh, concerned, worried, anxiety ridden, and we're dealing with a very, very small risk of death, thanks to modern medicine in part, but also thanks to a relatively weak pathogen. And what few people realize is that within three generations of Cortez's conquering of the Aztecs, that the native population in New Mexico, most of them Pueblo peoples, eight out of 10 people died. Our archeological population estimates before European arrival, um, archeologists always fight over those things. We, none of us believe each other's methodologies as we try to count people in the past, but every single one of them shows a 80% drop in population across that contact threshold. And that's a tremendous amount of loss of information, but it also is a tremendous amount of resilience. Well, as we move in the modern sort of post-colonial time period, there's also a tremendous amount of uh, reconstruction that's going on within Pueblo communities. Um, Lorraine's father making sure that uh, she has the opportunity to grow up with traditional values and traditional knowledge. There's a resurgence of that in many, many of the Pueblos. I mean, it was never really lost, but under the constant onslaught of television, of uh, popular culture, of uh, official Indian policy that took people out of the Pueblo and uh, with the intention of denying them their language and their culture. Uh, there's opportunities through the interaction between artists and museums uh, for reinforcing culture, for uh, strengthening a lot of the ties that uh, <sighs> in some senses are under assault by the greater uh, communities in which uh, native peoples live today. And the rest of us need to be sensitive to that and uh, allow native communities the freedom to express themselves and determine their own futures in uh, every dimension of their culture, including art, including religion, including the social networks that they uh, develop, including uh, excluding us uh, of the Euro-American persuasion uh, when they so choose. And it's, um, you know, it's an interesting position to be in as an archeologist who, again, I mean, archeology span has been one of the most uh, sort of, thoughtless appropriators of the past histories of native peoples and trying to turn that around so that instead we can be uh, a resource that they can choose to access when they want to uh, rather than us forcing it on them. Um, but uh, anyway, the, I, I'm sort of wandering but I hope you get the point. I think, you know, um, going back to uh, the ancestors, um, our ancient ones um, gave us a glimpse into their perspective of everyday life um, with what they were doing and what they were working with as far as like the elements. Um, in my own business, I, I title my work um, Visions from Our Past. And every piece that I make, I always dedicate it to um, our earliest teachers because I believe that they were the true masters of Pueblo pottery. And um, just keeping that alive is um, something that um, 
I really work hard toward. And um, it's just something that I really enjoy doing, just like all the other clay artists. We have many different um, types of artists, artistry in clay, and I, it's very admirable. It's not an easy thing to do. It's um, something that we just have to keep working at and um, just grow with. And this is something really exciting to be a part of this clay festival here in Silver City. I've always heard about um, the clay festival and a lot of um, people that have seen my work, my recreations of ancestral pieces. If I, I was telling um, some friends, if I had a dollar for every person that told me, have you been down to the Silver City collection to see the members pottery? I, I, I've never been, and today I am so happy to be here and so happy to share this platform with Eric. Um, he's wonderful, and I really love what the um, archaeology, um, the Office of Archaeology does in Santa Fe. Um, they're open to, to us so that we can come and learn these techniques of our ancestors, and they show us different um, ways that uh, what they've discovered. And it's just really a great relationship. I do want to uh, actually name her in things, which is Dr. Cynthia Bettison is the director of the museum at Western New Mexico University. And she embodies the modern tradition of museum management, which is to do everything possible to open the doors to ancestral people, uh, to the descendants of the ancestral people. And uh, again, the idea is that um, anything that modern uh, communities can do to strengthen uh, the variety of cultures that we enjoy in New Mexico is the multicultural state. I mean, we need to recognize that we can only enjoy that richness if all of those cultures are strong and sustained and thriving. The, uh, uh, we've, we're coming up quickly on the end of the hour that was set aside for this presentation. Uh, Lorraine, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to give? I would just like to wish everybody um, health and happiness. And um, I just wanna thank everybody for um, tuning in and also for supporting the Clay Festival. I think this is a wonderful, um, a wonderful platform and I'm really happy to be a part of it this year. Yeah. And I too express my appreciation to the years that the Clay Festival has contributed to sharing information across cultures uh, in the Southwest and uh, held together by the commonality of this remarkable medium known as clay. So if anyone wants to, you're welcome to uh, chat questions to us, or uh, if you'd like to unmute yourself, um, you can uh, ask questions directly and we'll take a couple extra minutes and uh, see if we can satisfy any curiosities that are out there. I think the host has the um, has to unmute. I think the sequence would be the host unmuting and then individuals. Yes. There we go, Shirley. <laughs> okay. Well, hi. Um, hi, Shirley. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been wonderful. I thought it was two hours, but 
I mean, I could just listen and listen. Um, I am not a potter. Uh, a friend of mine who is also online, and we won't say her name, but it's pretty clear. <laughs> um, Jill is a very good friend of mine. She is a potter, and um, she knows how much I love to learn about Native American pottery specifically and the history. So the combination, um, Lorraine and Eric, Having you together to present was just wonderful. I love it. Um, I, Lorraine, I sent <coughs> um, uh, just a comment to you because you said you love to go to museums. And if you're ever in the Phoenix area, um, I hope you will try to visit um, Western Spirit. It's a fairly new museum and it's, uh, it's, it's, they have some great collections. So I hope that's one thing. I did send you a question. I don't know if you saw it, but when I talked with a wood carver one time, he told me that a piece of wood tells him what it wants or it needs to be. So when he first touches it, the wood talks to him. Does clay talk to you? You actually can feel the clay. You feel the spirit of the clay when you're building. and you really have to let the clay go the way it wants to be. Um, if, if you're struggling with it, you know, I, what I have a tendency to do is sometimes I try to go against it, which isn't good. Um, so I'll put it aside and then I'll come back to it later after I take a break and then I'll just let it form the way it wants to go and flow the way it wants to go. If it's not meant to be um, a certain type of vessel, um, you know, that's the clay telling me what it wants to be. So, you know, working with um, wood, working with clay, working with stones, jewelry, um, you pretty much, um, you have that connection by, by feeling it and working with it, whether or not it's going to go in the direction you want it to, or whether it's going to go the, in the direction that it wants to. Um, that's that relationship that we have when we're working with our hands. Okay, so that does make sense to what, I mean, <clears throat> oh, pardon me. It is very similar then to what the wood carver told me. Um, yeah, it is because, you know, um, we believe that, you know, all of these elements have a life to it, and we're just the ones that are just um, working with it, but they're guiding us. So that's just how I've been taught. Yeah, um, again, this, this gentleman, he told me that, um, for example, he had a piece of wood and, um, I mean, this is just me making up an example, but mm -hmm. he to carve a dog, but it didn't want to be a dog. It wanted to be a horse. <laughs> yeah. He never, he never could get the piece of wood to look like a dog. <laughs> yeah. It didn't want to be a dog. I've been there. I've been I've been in situations where I was trying to form something and it just would not work for me. So I just, you know, okay, that's that. I'm gonna do something different now. And so I, I don't like to fight with anything, you know, like with the clay or anything like that. It's that's not the way that we're taught to we we're we're taught to respect the clay. We're taught to um, you know, pray before we actually work with the clay and even it goes further back when you're getting ready to dig for the clay or when you're ready to go out you just have to clear your thoughts and you know be in the right mindset in order to continue that process so interesting as i said i i just love learning uh i i do have a lot of native art and I know I really appreciate too Eric you mentioning that book I have to read it I already looked it up while the session was going so now I have to read it because I I've, all, I've learned in classes that there really isn't a word for art um, per se in a lot of the native cultures with that said though I have many pieces of what I call art um, pottery and oh goodness uh, rugs and other jewelry, but I just, 
I just find it also fascinating and what makes it more important to me is when I actually can meet the artist and talk to them and they can tell me, like you were just saying, how, how the piece, how the piece created itself almost. It's really interesting when you have that interaction with the artists because um, they'll tell you their inspiration for making the piece or, or why they titled this uh, particular piece of art with this name or, you know, just they'll, they'll tell you a lot about the creation of how you, how they came up with this idea. So I think it's very important for you to interact with the artists every time you go to an art show and just, just ask them these questions and they'll be truthful with you and let them know where their inspiration came from. And it's really interesting, you know, a lot of these, uh, uh, um, the, the stories that you learn from the artists. Absolutely. Oh yeah, I love it. Um, just out of curiosity, have you ever been to any of the markets here in the Phoenix area? I have. Um, I just recently did the Hertz show, the Indian Art Fair and Market. Um, that was in March, and that's a real big Native um, show. I've been doing that for the last maybe 15 years. And, you know, unfortunately, that was probably the last show that many of the artists did but because the pandemic was already hitting in the Northwest Coast area, which was Oregon and Washington, and it was kind of creeping its way down. And so that was really the last show that um, many of the artists did. And then right shortly after that, within that same week, we saw many shows cancel after that. And um, unfortunately, um, they've carried through to the month of October and um, we're still on the fence for November and December. Yes, absolutely. Um, of course, I'm familiar with the herd, but uh, yes. the, um, the Pueblo Grande Museum. My, oh, I love that place. Yes. Uh, my friend is the, um, is the director there now. She's, she's my hiking buddy. We've been hiking buddies for, mm, I think, this is 19 years now. Okay. Um, have you been then to the Indian market there? I have, and I took part in that for a long time also. And unfortunately, we got the letter to notification that that was um, canceled this year. But that's a great show and great market. And I've, I started off with the Pueblo Grand where they used to be in the parking lot next to the museum. And I had been with them for quite some time, but I really enjoy going out there. Um, I love the um, Phoenix area. There's a lot of collectors out there, um, a lot of people that are very knowledgeable with Indian art. So it's a wonderful place. Um, I've also taken part in the Litchfield um, Indian market as well. Um, there's uh, several other sh little shows that I've done out there as well, but it's a great market. I love the whole Arizona market. Oh, that's good to hear. I love that. Yeah. So hopefully when things are semi, semi back to normal, um, maybe you'll be here and we'll have to connect. So absolutely. Where, um, where are your pieces available for sale now? Or do you have pieces available? I do have pieces available and I don't have a website per se. Um, I can be reached through email. And if you want to um, send me your email address in the Zoom chat box, I can go ahead and send you some pictures of my work. Um, I haven't really built up my website because a lot of these, I do a lot of research and I've viewed a lot of private collections and I viewed the museum collections and I really respect that. Um, I, I try to keep my work limited as far as what I want on the internet because um, you have so much social media going on as far as um, crafters and I don't want these designs um, put on Etsy or you know made into t-shirts or something like that so I, I'm very protective of um, some of these designs and well most of the, des the designs but um, if you want to go ahead oh I, I see that you did give me your email I will send you pictures of my work so um, but that's just how I feel Oh, and I, I totally um, understand. And yeah, there's a, there's a lot of pirating going on 
on and there's a lot of um, misuse of um, designs. And um, uh, I just want to be very cautious about that and respectful. Well, and I think that goes back even to something that Eric said, and I, I sent him a private um, thumbs up because it's so, it's really, I use the word heartwarming, but I, I just think it's, it's just so heartwarming or wholesome for a non-Native to express the kind of concepts that he was about that if, a, if an area of clay um, can, can be used for uh, creative purposes, then he just walks away or um, other things like that. And I think we've seen too many non-natives take images, which you were just referring to, but also the whole thing about the fake turquoise. I just took a class recently through the Ameren um, Museum about that. And the lady was talking about how, oh, I don't know what word she used, but almost like discouraging and how, how hard it is to make people though understand that there's such a vast difference between um, even reconstituted turquoise, which is what I think is, I think that's the right word that's used pretty much today, um, as opposed though to the plastic quote unquote turquoise. Yes, unfortunately, as artists, we're being faced with a lot of that. Um, it's just, uh, I, I feel for the jewelers because um, you're seeing more and more um, like stabilized materials coming through and, you know, versus like the real traditional um, stones that are used. And um, it's, it's really getting harder and harder to tell what's real and what's not real. And um, it's just, uh, it, it takes education. It takes, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad Amarant offered those classes. Um, did you say Amarant? Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Right. I'm, I think um, knowledge is power. And um, there used to be the Indian Arts and Crafts Association. And uh, I think they may have a presence still, um, but they were really good at going from show to show and they would have samples of um, traditional items versus manufactured items versus um, you know, non-traditional items. And um, it was really a, a great tool, learning tool, especially for um, the buyers. Um, that's why we have a lot of shows that are um, juried shows. Um, the Santa Fe Indian Market, the Southwest Western Indian Association, um, we have to submit images of our work and how we how we made our work and um, it goes through a, a during process and they're the ones it has to be um, handmade native made and so you know I'm grateful for shows like that because um, we're not mixed in with um, you know say somebody that does uh, something commercially and um, mass produced so there is a really good um, benefit to that. I can imagine, of course. Um, I know, and, and I know. It's, oh, I'm sorry, Shirley. It's great no. for the buyer because you're buying, you know what you're buying is authentic and it's not um, made, you know, who knows where it's made, but you know, you're buying something authentic. Absolutely. And I, again, I, I'm so sorry, I can't remember the word or the name, but I know Pueblo Grande has a, a person that their sole responsibility is to validate or verify that everyone who is um, part of the show is actually Native American. And there's a word for that. Maybe you know, Eric. I, I can't remember the, what the word is. Um, you mean like a federally recognized tribe um, or... Well, it's a, a, all I know is that they, they um, not hire, but they get someone to, the, to volunteer that has the right credentials to be able to um, verify each artist, that they have the knowledge or the background or the whatever. 
uh, to be able to do that. It's good. I'm glad that shows are doing that because <clears throat> it's really important um, for the artists that um, we keep things um, we keep things in our realm um, that we're not um, putting out stuff that's not um, traditional. Uh, well, not I don't want to say traditional, but um, we're that things that aren't um, aren't real, you know, that we're, we're not just passing off something that's um, cheaply made or anything like that. And right. um, yeah, there's a lot of um, genuine, well, there's, it's genuine and it's not paced, uh, passed off as fake. Right. Yeah. I think what you're trying to say, you know, it's genuine. <clears throat> it's authentic. There's, yeah. there's a very interesting example, historical example of how complex this concept of tradition can be and it involves the traditional pottery of Jemez Pueblo and Jemez Pueblo uh, in pre-Spanish times uh, had access to an incredibly distinctive uh, clay that uh, took organic paint well uh, I can recognize a shirt of Hamus black and white at arm's length just by its appearance. And after the, the Spanish arrival and the sort of the, the trauma of uh, forced movement of people to the missions and leading, events leading to the Pueblo Revolt and the Reconquest, there was a decision made by the religious leadership of uh, Amos Pueblo that they did not want the secrets of making Amos black and white pottery to be subject to appropriation by the Spanish. And so all of the people of Amos Pueblo stopped, all of the potters stopped making Amos black and white. And we see it drop out of the archaeological record. And it is the consequence of that is that a lot of 20 years ago, what was Hamas black and white pottery or Hamas traditional pottery were a whole suite of techniques that were borrowed from adjacent Pueblos. The potters were using whatever sort of a, um, uh, a grab bag of techniques to make pottery that was now their tradition. And where the portal vendors of the Palace of the Governors uh, sort of uh, enforce a concept of tradition, that concept of tradition with Hamas pottery includes a tremendous variety of uh, commercial clays, commercial paints, commercial, uh, even post-firing painting with acrylics. That is and has been Hamas traditional pottery for really the past uh, several generations at least. And it's only been very recently that a potter at Hamas, who is also a religious leader, decided that it was time to uh, revisit the question of what had been the pre-Spanish um, uh, Hamas black and white pottery. And so he started, a restarted an experimental process. He recreated it because the knowledge had passed. Uh, and so now we have coming out of Hamas Pueblo, two traditions of pottery. One that is a resurrection of uh, what was happening 500 years ago. And the other, the uh, continuous development of an adaptation of creativity of, Pueb of Hamas Pueblo potters to the resources that they had available to them, which include uh, modern commercial uh, raw materials and clays, and it is traditional. There's no, uh, you can't criticize uh, it 
uh, and the same thing at, at the Pueblo of Acoma. You have potters who um, are painting slip cast ware and selling them in the Acoma design style. And it's explicitly called ceramic. And that compares with uh, potters who are digging their own clay and making pots from the very beginning. And that is called pottery. And the two traditions live side by side and they're equally valid in a cultural sense. Um, again, there's a tendency uh, even for other Pueblos to not view these things as being as, uh, it's trying to instill a concept of tradition that is too narrow, that doesn't fit the modern world. Very interesting. I didn't, I didn't know anything about that, but, but I, I hope I understood what you were saying, that um, it doesn't um, diminish either one it's just like there, there are like two paths that are being followed by the same group of people. Yep. Okay, well, because I don't know how long you guys want to stay, because I just love talking to you guys. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I want to I at least uh, then give you a, a glimpse of who I am. So let me do that. Maybe not. Oh, hi. <laughs> Anyway, um, I just, it was such a great presentation. I, I, I have to say that I'm sorry that there weren't more participants, but I have nothing to do with the conference, so I can't really say I'm sorry. But um, it's, been, it's been such a pleasure listening to you, and I look forward to hearing from you, Lorraine, about your work. Um, you can, at any time. You can send me information. Um, so I'm, I'm always excited to, uh, as I said earlier, I love pieces when I've had a chance to talk with the artist. And it means so much more to me. Uh, Jill has purchased some pieces for me when she was places that I, I wasn't able to go. And she always made sure she would get like full biographical information about the artist because she knows how important that is to me. So thank you so much folks for your time. It was it was great meeting you. Thank you. We appreciate that and your questions as well. Thanks. Thank you. I'll be in touch. Okay, great. Thank you again, Eric. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Oh, Lorraine, thank you. Hi, thank you, Eric. <laughs> that was so interesting. I love, I love what you were talking about. That was really informative. I learned a lot from, um, uh, oh gosh, I just lost her name, from Western New Mexico University. Cynthia. Cynthia, yeah. I, we had a really good visit. 